right, we're back with Conversations with Keith, continuing our political uh, uh, view. We had Judge Fields on. That video will be up on the uh, website. And his challenger, uh, Pendleton County Sheriff Craig Peoples, um, another Pendleton County High School graduate. You'll, you'll see actually a lot of those. I don't know if we have any of the candidates necessarily um, that is not a high school graduate from Pendleton County, which is good because they're lifelong residents of the county. They understand the county, and they have that... Um, that, that love of the county that they want to do. So that's always good. But actually, that's kind of the first question. Tell us about your journey from your uh, 86 graduate? Yes. 1986 graduate. Um, from there to sitting here as candidate for judge exec, tell us about your journey. The journey, you know, has been long. You know, I started working here in the county as a funeral director in our family business probably when I was 16 and received my funeral director's license. So I've I've worked in high school with uh, various different uh, establishments here in the county. After graduating high school, uh, I've worked outside the county for a short time. And in 91, I came back and was employed as a part-time deputy sheriff until 93 when I took the position full-time. In 94, I uh, came in as chief deputy. And then in 2007, I served my first term, elected to my first term as a sheriff. So I've served the county for uh, in a political capacity for 24 years, and I've loved every minute of it. 91, 93, was that Donnie Mays from part-time and full-time? Was he the sheriff at that time? He was. Okay. And, and actually, what is really interesting, because that's he made the same jump that you're hoping to make from sheriff to judge exec, and that's what Donnie did. Do, do you recall anything from that time of watching him make that jump or, or conversations with him that led you to want to make that jump or something you've learned from him? No, there wasn't anything uh, from that. You know, if you go back in history, uh, my great-grandfather was sheriff in 1927. Oh, I didn't know that. And so, I, you know, here I am sheriff today, some 60 years later or more. And sheriff of Pendleton County? Sheriff of Pendleton County, when you can only serve one term. Really? Yep. Yeah. And one term being four, four years. years. Four years? Yes. Oh, that's interesting. And then, you know, a lot of the older people of the community remember David Grimmel, mm -hmm. as judge executive for uh, several terms. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and he's my great uncle. Oh, I didn't know that either. That's kind of following in the footsteps of some family history. But the reason to jump from uh, sheriff to judge is I feel like I have a lot to offer to the citizens of Pumpkin County. Uh, good communication, uh, a lot of common sense, and I feel like that I can bring those to the court and to other boards and committees that the judge has to work with that, you know, progressively get Pendleton County into the future. Right. So, Judge Brewer, was that on your mom or your dad's side? Dad. Dad's side? Did not know you related to it. And that's why I call this conversation, because I learned things about the, about uh, individuals and peoples and the issues as well as uh, the people that are watching. And, and that's why I always say in these conversations, it might spur some other questions that I wasn't planning on having. <laughs> because uh, I didn't know it going in. Um, so one of the things um, that, that we've talked about, or, or I talked about um, in other ones is, I think in any race, the incumbents always have an advantage because they have some experience there. It doesn't matter what, the, what the, um, the, the position is. They also have a voting record there that could also be a negative. So David ha is the incumbent. He has some experience there, but what is it about you going into this position that you bring a fresh pair of eyes to the position that you think are important for voters to know about? My ability, one, to communicate again, and two, to enable cooperation. Okay. Uh, you know, on the campaign trail, talking to different people uh, over the last several weeks, you know, a lot of the, and, and I know this from personal experience as being the sheriff, there's not, in some cases, not all, cooperation between governments or between entities of government. And if we all don't cooperate together, we're sliding backwards than we are moving forward. Gotcha. And I feel like that I can bring that level of cooperation or improve, at least, on that level of cooperation. Uh, David had four years as judge, mm -hmm. and he was magistrate for four years. So do I have an uphill battle to climb to be with him being incumbent? Sure I do, mm -hmm. and that's expected. Uh, but I feel with my 
career as law enforcement, as the lead chief law enforcement officer in the county, that, you know, as you I am able to, to uh, uh, hopefully people will, will agree and uh, wish to elect me and think that, you know, I can still have good things to offer. Okay. Let's kind of explore a couple of things that you talked about there. You said on the campaign trail, some of the people have talked to you about um, concerns of a lack of cooperation. What what are there specific areas or specific things, um, specific projects maybe for the future that you want to see the groups to get together and do a better job underneath your mantle of leadership um, in providing for Pendleton County? Are there some certain areas there? Nothing that I can specifically dwell on. Uh, at this point, uh, because I'm, I've got a lot to learn, right? Uh, and I understand that, but I'm eager and willing and, and able to do that. Uh, but you know, you take just for an example, the issues we had working with the school and, and my office in the fiscal court on trying to get school resource officer program. It took way longer than it should have. It was a lot more complicated than it needed to be. Uh, so that's you know, for as an example, that problem has been taken care of the court and the school when we all. Are working together with that to make sure that our kids are safe. Mm -hmm. um, but there's other, you know, you have different boards. You have a 109 board. You have a planning and zoning board. Planning and zoning, I'm I'm in favor for. Uh, do I think it probably needs to be tweaked or massaged and manipulated a little bit to to fit Pendleton County needs and not a, a reflection of what some of our other counties, Northern Kentucky counties, may may be? I think so, and I'm not. I'm not well versed in the planning and zoning, but you know there's people that can teach me, mm -hmm. and then with those people we can make things better or improve if there's improvement to be done. Uh, solid waste. I believe the last uh, information I was given, something like 20 some, 25, 30 percent of the people in Pendleton County who don't have trash pickup. So where's the trash going? Because they, they have trash. Because they have trash. Yeah. They're going to hollers or they're being thrown in the back room of a house or in the bed of a truck and sits there until the rats start moving. I think we can do a better job with mandatory trash collection in the county. And it's not expensive mm -hmm. on, on a uh, quarterly basis. I think it's like $36. Mm -hmm. So it's not expensive to have mandatory trash pickup and they come right to your door. Yeah. Uh, so something like or that. Or the end of your driveway. Not like in my case, because I have a long driveway out in the county, so I have to take it up. But but it's still still at the same time, I have that option there, and it's taken care of. And um, I don't have it, you know, building up at the back of my house, and like you said, attracting varmint and, and different things along those lines. You're not throwing it in a holler, and you're not burning it. Yeah. So you know, those are two things that I would like to work on uh, that I think we can improve in. And uh, you know, of course, emergency services are number one to me. Mm -hmm. uh, for being in the business for 24 years. I want to make sure that our dispatch center stays in Pendleton County. Uh, that's one vital piece of, of uh, infrastructure that we have. If we lose that, I think we're hurting. We already don't have a jail, we're already transporting prisoners. So if we have to contract out our dispatching services, I think it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, improvement to the ambulance services, how can we improve those? How can we improve our fire services, get communities already not serving Pendleton County and we'll pay those residents of paying a tax mm -hmm. to that. Uh, and that's being worked out and discussed currently with the administrators. Uh, but how do we fix that for the future? Yeah. And so th those are some issues that, that I'm holding dear to. I saw a news report last night, I'm not sure if you saw it, we haven't talked about it, that Grant County is closing their jail. Have you seen that from last time? I have not seen that. Yeah, there was a news report that was posted online that Grant County's closing their jail. I don't know when, I don't know anything about it, but I thought, wow, that's, uh, I know they've had some problems over there with some lawsuits and those kind of things, and I'm not well versed on it, but that was surprising to me that um, they would close their jail. And that's been rumored over the last year. Uh -huh. uh, their current judge, I guess, and, and jailer are at odds, I reckon, and uh, so they talked about closing. Uh, our jailer and physical court talked about moving us from Boone County to Grant County mm -hmm. uh, for a cheaper rate yeah. on, on housing our prisoners. Um, and of course we did make the change from Boone to Campbell. Correct. Uh, for exactly the same reason, for yes. a cheaper rate, um, you know, um, and, and saving the county money that might be able to use in other areas. Correct. So, um, well, you mentioned about um, um, SROs. 
and uh, that has been a hot button topic over the last six months. And there, there's actually going to be several questions in here. <coughs> but what do you see as the benefit? And should should that be a school district cost? Should that be a community cost? What's your view as far as the importance of, of being involved in that SRO program? The SRO program is extremely important uh, for the safety of our kids, for the safety of our teachers. Uh, a uniformed, sworn law enforcement officer doesn't get any better. Do we make mistakes? Yes. But we're the first line of defense in most cases for some schools. Granted, we only have two resource officers and we have four schools. So are we lacking? Yes, we are. Can we improve on that? I don't know. Uh, as far as cost, uh, who should bear that burden? I believe it should be a joint venture, like it is now, uh, between the school system, uh, the fiscal court, and the sheriff's office. You know, I absorb some of the cost through my budget uh, for, for the school resource officer. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like the county should be uh, afford some of that cost as well. I mean, it's their kids, their grandkids, hopefully that are in, in the school. And if we all don't work together, like I said, in the cooperation issue, mm -hmm. then nobody's going to prevail. Yeah. Now you had mentioned that the 24 years that you've been involved in serving the community in some sort of political position, whether it was as a deputy sheriff, fleet detective, different roles. What experiences have you gained through those 24 years that you can call upon and say, this is why I know I can do this job, is because of blah, blah, blah. I hate to beat a flooded horse. Okay. But let's talk about the flood of 97. Okay. <laughs> I was given the position of emergency management director two days prior to that flood. Yeah. I had no idea what the word DES spelled or stood for. <laughs> and I told Governor Patton that when he was here in the school center that day. And uh, we all chuckled and had a good laugh. But I learned a lot uh, on the emergency management side on how to deal with disasters. And we have an emergency management director who does really well with that. But as a judge executive, there's a place for me or for the judge. Mm -hmm. And I know that place. I know when, just from experience over the 20 years, uh, to when to, to ask for a declaration, how quick I can do that. I'm, still well knowledge mm -hmm. in that area and the community knows the overwhelming uh, support and resources that came into this county into this city to mediate mm -hmm. the flood then and still today and I still have some connections mm -hmm. uh, that I can reach back onto and say hey what, what's your thoughts can you help me here and things like that well and actually that that, that mm -hmm. really segues ni nicely into one of the questions I was going to have is one of the things I've learned since I've moved in from retiring as a school teacher to this position is how much the local uh, government leaders have to work with the state level, uh, have uh, contacts, uh, you know, I contacted Mayor um, Stinson this morning about having a meeting possibly today to talk about an issue and he's in Frankfurt talking about the water rehab project. And I, I really was surprised about how often those communications go. And you have to have open lines. Do you have those contacts, those um, people that you could reach out to, uh, to serve that position that it is in Frankfurt that is necessary for leadership of the county? I don't have specific contacts to a specific question, mm -hmm. probably as it relates to Judge Executive or the county government but I have contacts in Frankfurt that I can call and say, can you, here's what I need, can you point me in the right direction, can you give me the right name, right number. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have those types of connections to be able to do that. And are there an example uh, of, that you can give us on where you've done that in your role as sheriff that has benefited the county through you working with contacts in, in Frankfurt? Nothing that I can think of that's county specific, but I, as president of the Kentucky Sheriff's Association for this year, mm -hmm. I uh, spoke to legislators. I 
about the pawn shop bill, which was is very uh, highly needed for law enforcement purposes to be able to hopefully recover stolen property uh, and make pawn shops uh, gather the right information that they needed that will help us in that respect. So I've testified in front of the legislature uh, now and over the past years for different various different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and just my contacts through the association to CACO. You know, I've dealt with CACO for 12 Explain years. Explain what CACO is. A lot of people sure. won't know what that is. CACO is the Kentucky Association of Counties. Okay. It's uh, one, a funding source or of availability for counties to get grant money through. Uh, they provide us grant money to, you know, buy cruisers or county equipment. And it's, uh, they do our insurance and things of that nature. But there's, uh, attorneys mm -hmm. on staff that I can call and have called for, through the sheriff's office needs and, and to ask questions about different pieces of legislature or a different law or something that may be coming down the pike that I need to be aware of. So I have those contacts and I've had them for quite a long time. Because yeah. a, a great example of, of uh, being able to have a running conversation as Frankfurt was in six months ago with all the pension and how much it was going to cost local governments your depart for your office, uh, as well as um, city of Falmouth, with the library, it was going to affect everybody. Yes. And that was a running conversation that not just Pendleton County people, but every single county and small town needed to have a running conversation with in Frankfurt people to have an understanding of what it could potentially do to their department, their office, their county. Um, uh, mentioning on that pawn shop bill. <coughs> there was a rash for a while here, it seemed to be, I don't know, maybe two, three years ago, a lot of burglaries. And so that pawn shop bill, as I understand it, um, pawn shop, somebody steals something from a Pendleton County home, they want to sell it at a pawn shop, the pawn shop was are now required to keep that information of serial numbers and those kind of things, and if a homeowner has provided you all with the serial numbers, now you can match the two up. And a Pendleton County person may get their property back. Correct. Is that what the pawn shop bill was? Basically. Gotcha. Okay. Um, we posted on Facebook uh, a, a pinned up the top of our page about questions about what do you all want us to ask these candidates? All of them. No, nobody specific. Not one office. But in the judge executive uh, portion, probably the most commented on is about internet service. Yes. Uh, me and you've talked about this, Judge Fields and I have talked about it, um, that I feel personally it's the most important issue in the county. Yes. Uh, for businesses, um, I, I made the comment um, earlier that I think this is an issue that whoever sits in that chair should address presently every single day. They should think about this issue or do something about it and for whoever's the next one every single day because it is so vital for businesses. Um, I, I've shared stories that I know of a local business person who has to get up at 2 a.m. when they're doing a bid for a project to print off the, um, the plans for that project because the internet um, service is so slow during the day they, they can't print off the plans. Sure. Um, that prevents local entrepreneurs from starting business. I, I was told about a person who's wanting to sell their home. It's a nice home, probably will run 200,000 plus range when it finally sells. Got a call from a Northern Kentucky person interested through seeing it online. And the first one of the questions they were asked is, what was your internet speed? When they told him, he said, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've shared the story that my son was attending Gateway, took an online course so that he didn't have to drive to Covington every day except our speed wasn't fast enough to run the online course, so he had to drive to Gateway to use their computer to take his online course, right. which wasn't the reason. So I, my personal feeling is this is the number one issue that addresses all the government leaders in Pendleton County. Yes. So what's your knowledge of internet services and what is a plan or something that you're wanting to do to focus upon to bring this up to the county? And like I said, it was by far the number one issue that was brought up on Facebook of people asking us to make sure to ask about. Yes, and I've uh, been asking those questions and been asked 
those questions when I've been out knocking on doors. Yeah. Um, and I've talked with representatives from Cincinnati Bell within the last week. Okay. And to get an understanding of where they're at, where they're going. Because uh, the complaints I was getting was, well, the, that line you see hanging on that pole right there, that's the power optics line. But they're not hooking it into my house. Mm -hmm. uh, it's They're telling us that since they, as in Cincinnati Bell, are telling the homeowners that it may be six months to nine months before it's turned on in their house. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a 15-minute conversation with a representative from them last week. And he said part of that is is we don't have all of our permits to go down some of the county roads. They might be on a state road, but if you're adjacent, you're on a county road adjacent to that state road, we have not may not have been able to run it down that road yet. Because is it a county permit, a state permit both. that they're waiting on? Both. Okay. Uh, so if it's if the pole or if the line is running down a state roadway, they've got to get a permit from the state. Gotcha. If the line is running down a county road, they've got to get a county permit. Gotcha. And they've got several permits, and I've got a list of, of those permits so far. Uh, but he what said, office does the county permits? Is that Brian Thompson's? Thompson's? Yes. Brian okay. Thompson. mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and the guy told me, he said, some of the issue is if we have to traverse through somebody's private property, not, not the, the, the right-of-way, mm -hmm. state or county right-of-way, we've got to get permission. They don't want to give us the permission to go through their field or their farm to lay the phi optics, mm -hmm. then we got to find another way. And that delays the process. He said, a lot of the times if it's on a, one road and we haven't turned it on yet, it's because it's not completed its loop. Yeah. And they're looping it back, I uh, understand correctly, to the phone hub here in Falmouth from the phone hub in Bowen. Gotcha. So they're, they're trying to finish the connections before they can actually turn it on. I know we, in talking about the loop, that's one of the things I've learned. We had an interview with the Kentucky Wired people um, that are running 3,400 miles of fiber optics throughout the state to government buildings, and I think there's four or five locations in Pendleton County, and then providers will be able to come off those lines and go to homes, not the state or county government, but private companies. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's ran here in Pendleton County. But they haven't created the loop. They're on their way to Brooksville, they'll go to uh, Maysville, and they'll complete that loop back to Lexington. And once that's completed, which is scheduled for August of 19, and that loop's completed, then they'll turn it off. Right. Um, and they tell me the reason why for that loop is because if it goes down, the line goes down from Lexington to Northern Kentucky, then they can send it from Lexington through Brooksville the other way and not and keep service. Correct. But they won't turn it on when it's just one way. I guess that's what you're talking about. Yeah, and my understanding um, is that some of our feeds come from Dry Ridge. Mm -hmm. So they're coming across 467, Kentucky 22, and areas over there to get maybe to Falmouth and Butler. And it just hasn't completed that loop to come back around either. And that's that's their backup or mm -hmm. their main truck line so that if it does go down, like our 911 system, we get our 911 lines come in from two different directions here at our dispatch center. Okay. Uh, it's a redundancy. Which is good. So if one line goes down, then or one cable goes down, let's say, then they flip of a switch, they can run in a different way and reroute our 911 lines. So yeah. my understanding that's what that is, is the looping and coming in from different directions. Um, what I would like to be able to do is, is sit down with Cincinnati Bell, people who are more knowledgeable about that than I am if, if I'm elected and and discuss what can the county do to make this faster, to mm -hmm. get this project completed, yeah. uh, to get it to be turned on in, in more houses than what they have it turned on into. Right now. And it may be going back to what we talked about earlier with the, the communication with the state level, with the contacts at the state level, um, to push those state permits on as quickly as possible to provide them in a more timely manner um, so that they get their permits and they can move on. Obviously, we're going to have direct effect on the county permits, sure. um, and that those shouldn't really be an issue. But, you know, the importance of having those state com, um, uh, contacts to encourage that to occur as, as fast as possible. Yes. Um, you know, we have a lot of people who work um, in um, North Kentucky or Cincinnati um, I know of one couple who goes over every day to the public library or to McDonald's and uses their Wi-Fi.
so that they don't have to drive the north of Cincinnati to their job. Yes. Um, and I'm sure that they would love to be able to just sit around their house. How many banks or businesses utilize phone centers? Mm -hmm. You know, we have enough property, even though it may be here in the floodplain of Falmouth, but there's some buildings here on Shelby Street. Why couldn't you run your phone lines and keep them high enough above the 52-inch floodplain or flood level uh, and run an internet cafe or mm -hmm. a phone center for, for a small business? You know, you're not going to be getting phone calls from somebody you can't understand. Huh? <laughs> very, very much. Very much. I understand that. And, and like I said, I, to me, it's, it's the number one issue. I understand all the other things, but for looking for Pendleton County in 10, 15 years, because to be honest with you, whatever is laid now is going to be antiquated in 10, 15 years. Yes. But looking for Pendleton <coughs> County's future more than roads, even though we want good roads, more than a lot of other things, that is vital yes. uh, to the growth of businesses, to um, home ownership and, and, and building of homes in this county. When you're building homes, you're creating other jobs for our local construction workers and, and those uh, type of uh, technical careers. Um, an area that has also been hit upon, and uh, this will be the most unfair question I'm going to ask you because it is a problem in every community in the United States. And to my knowledge, no community has been able to solve the drug issue problem. I told David yesterday, and I'll tell you the same thing, if you have the answer to the drug issue, don't run for judge exec, but um, go around and sell this plan to solve the drug issue, and you're going to become a billionaire because yes. everybody's looking for the answer to the drug issue that affects. I, I shared with him, I remember back in the presidential election, Trump was in Delaware speaking. And he was talking about the, the rural counties and cities in Delaware dealing with the heroin and meth problems. Mm -hmm. And that just really set home with me at that point in time. This is a nationwide problem. Yes. It's, people want to say, oh, that's Falmouth, that's Pendleton County. Hey, I'm sorry, you could go anywhere <coughs> and, and just name any small rural city, and they're dealing with the same issue. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say it's an unfair question, because nobody knows how to solve it right now. Right. But it's obviously a question everybody wants to ask. Yes. So, you've been on the front line of sheriff fighting this drug. I mean, you're probably the first one facing this drug issue. Where do we stand? What's being done? What's a plan for the future? Because, you know, one of the things that um, I was talking to Bill Mitchell about, he had made a comment once that we have a lot of local businesses who can't fill jobs. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues was they can't find people to pass drug tests. Correct. So this issue is not just a drug issue with those people. It affects our businesses. It affects our economic system as a county. I mean, I mean it's just so wide-ranging. So what is the issue? What, is, what can you do there? What have you done, Sheriff? And what are you planning on doing as Judge Exec to address this issue? Well, as, as Sheriff, uh, and, and Todd and I both have worked the drug issue just about as hard as we can and have the ability to do. Uh, it takes people. It takes money. When you say people, are you talking about who you're talking about in people? I'm talking about informants. Okay. Okay. We, the public, the neighbors, can provide us with the information of who's where and who's doing what. And we take that information. Okay. We build, mm -hmm. a, build an investigation off of that. But the court system, our hands are tied so bad that if I want to charge you with trafficking, mm -hmm. but I've got to have an X number of amount of buys off of you and get maybe a certain weight or a certain number of pills before I can even present it to even get a trafficking charge. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard uh, and it, it costs a lot of money. Uh, our court system, if there's an overdose, or our legislation, not our court system. If there's an overdose at someone's house, and a third party person calls and say, Johnny's on the floor. Mm -hmm. he, he's overdosed, got a needle on his arm. Poor Johnny, he always gets blamed for everything. He does, yes. <laughs> we can respond, and we do. 
but the question comes up, why aren't you going to charge him? There's heroin there, there's fentanyl there, there's meth there, whatever mm -hmm. the drug is. Why aren't you charging somebody? And that's, that's a fair question. Yes. And that we've been legislated out of that ability to do that. Really? Over the past legislative, uh, I think it was House Bill 463 two or three years ago, legislated that if we're responding to a third party call for assistance for someone who's overdosed, we cannot charge that person for possession of the heroin or whatever the drug is. They have a free ride to the hospital where if they refuse to go with the ambulance after they've been Narcan six, seven times, mm -hmm. they're free to go. And I can't do anything about it. Wow. Uh, if there's drug, if there's a quantity of drugs there, I'm going to take that, of course, uh -huh. and seize it. But I can't do anything about that person either being just a user or a trafficker. So, so you go in, somebody, little Johnny, <coughs> has the overdose. You go in and you find in the process of, of, of dealing with him and, and bringing him back to life and administering Narcan. Um, laying right there on the table is the biggest amount of drug that you've ever seen in Pendleton County and you can't charge him with drug trafficking because the legislators have said you can't do that. Correct. Because somebody's called because they've overdosed. Well, that's the most idiotic thing I think I've ever heard. Yeah. Now, and I, I've, I've taken the stance, and it's not happened, of course, uh, that if one of those types of calls happens, and, and to use your gesture of that much dope, yeah. I'm going to charge them anyway. If the court wants to dismiss it at that point, let the court dismiss it after it gets into the system. You got that much drugs, you're going to jail. I'm sorry. Yeah. I have no uh, no problem with that. And then the, the courts can take the the fallout yes. if they decide to do that. That, yes. that you've done what you felt like needed to be done as far as arresting and getting a drug trafficker off the street. Yeah. So go ahead. As a as a physical court and a judge executive. Our hands are tied as well, mm -hmm. uh, from what I know from their abilities. Have they provided us with some additional money and, uh, and, a, and a, um, a task force person over the last three, four years? Yes, they have. Uh, Short-lived, of course, because they're you know they don't have the the excess funds to be able to give to us to be able to do what we need to do on the drug level. And mm -hmm. you know through our asset forfeiture program, we don't need it. It, it only goes so far. Um, so it, it's hard. Uh, I think, you know, the problem is in the court, the court system, we have a drug court program, which is a good program, and I believe in drug court. The problem with drug court is not very many people successfully complete it. Mm -hmm. Successfully. They'll complete it and they'll graduate. Six months, a year, two years down the road, a stressor hits them for whatever reason doesn't have to be drug related or anything. Boom. They take a hit and they're back on the drugs again. We once we can't hold their feet to the fire long enough. You know, I know of people who have been under the influence drug users that have went to treatment, long term treatment, mm -hmm. left Pendleton County and don't come back. You have to get away from your friends. You have to get away from the people who enable you yeah. to use again. And, and my position on that would be, I don't think it's, I like how you said your friends. I don't think it's the community, because wherever they're moving to, the same thing's there. Yeah. They just don't have that group of friends right. that they fall back in line with. They might have a different set of friends over in the new community, that's not involved in that group. Um, but there are people in that other community too. Oh, They're sure just getting away from the enablers. That they know. That they it's know. It's not as easy to go to the corner and and get a eight ball or whatever it is they're wanting, some Oxycontin or whatever. It's not as easy to drive, uh, you know, it's easy right now to drive 35, 40 miles to Reading Road uh, over the Ryan area in Cincinnati mm -hmm. and get whatever you want. They love it when they see a Kentucky license plate holding in up there. They know what you're after. Mm -hmm. right? If you've moved 200 miles from Cincinnati, not that it's not there, you just don't know where to go get it. Gotcha. So we have 
families, people have to make the tough decision and say, go away. Mm -hmm. Don't come back. Come and visit us. We'll come and visit you. But leave what you know. Start with somewhere else. Gotcha. Get away from the drug problem. Gotcha. So you, you mentioned two four, well, two things uh, that I wanted to, to explore because I'm not sure what they mean. Um, task force, what did you mean by that when you said they provided you a task force? And then the forfeiture <coughs> asset program. I, I kind of have an idea of what it is, but touch upon that a little bit more of what you've done with those kind of things and what they are. Uh, a couple years ago uh, now, uh, the fiscal court uh, allotted us some money to hire someone to be our drug unit. Okay. That's all he was going to do was work narcotics, nothing else. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I mean by task force. We are in the Northern Kentucky Drug Task Force region, mm -hmm. but they want us to provide a body before they will come here and work. Gotcha. And I don't have the extra body, law enforcement officer, to be able to send to that task force to, to work mostly Kenton, Campbell, and Boone County maybe some Grant County, and we not hardly see them down here. So you've had a person in the past, and then that person's gone away? Yes. And so how long ago were you part of that task force because you had somebody? Well, we were a task force of one. Okay. This guy, and, you know, Todd and I and the other okay. deputies. Uh, that was a little over a year, year and a half ago, Okay. I guess. Uh, and it, not that it wasn't going to work. Things changed. And it wasn't uh, nothing with the physical court or uh, nothing with our office. It was the person we hired. His lifestyle was changing, uh, uh, so he had to make a change, gotcha. which was understandable. Um, on the asset forfeiture part, that is a program that if we go out and we make a drug arrest and we seize a vehicle, we seize property, uh, both real estate or personal property, then at the conclusion of the case, we can ask the judge to forfeit that property to us. Okay, And when that happens, we then turn around and sell that piece of property, that car, mm -hmm. that real estate, the TV. Uh, and then we put that money back into our asset forfeiture program. That money can only be used for law, for law enforcement purposes and we use it to help in our drug investigations. And so that prevents money have to be used from taxpayer funds correct. to cover and, and fight this battle, and instead taxpayer funds that can be used for emergency, the dispatch center, correct. funding it, and upgrading it, um, road improvements, or, or whatever it may be. Yes. Okay. Well, then it can't be used for salaries. You're talking about the asset forfeiture yes, funds, yeah. Yes. But again, monies that could be used for salaries, if the asset forfeiture program wasn't being used, had to be diverted over there, now it can be kept back into the general fund and possibly used for salaries where it increases needed. Yes. Over our 20, my 24 years, uh, we've had uh, several large forfeitures, and we've been able to, instead of using taxpayer dollars to buy vehicles for the office, new weapons for the deputies, uh, we've been able to use asset forfeiture money to do that. And we have four, three, four cars still in our fleet uh, of, v of seven that our asset forfeiture purchased vehicles. And how much is a, a car generally running those three or four? Generally about $30,000. So that's, that's $90,000 to $120,000 that you've used that hadn't had to be taxpayers, but you've used the property for mall breakers. People who didn't want to be, a, as I refer to it, as a, a positive in the community, but rather a negative in the community. Okay. We've taken uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 cases over my 24-year period uh, to federal court uh, for I've, drugs. I think we have one uh, sentencing on November 8th that yes. we'll be following up, that we've been following the progression of that case. Um, and I, I will go there as far as asking you more about that since that case is not final. You mentioned earlier some things about zoning and tweaking and zoning. Um, of course, the, they're in the process now of going some comprehensive planning changes with yard sales and different things in zoning. You had mentioned, I think, out on your you were going around last night. You've been out talking to people. What are some things that they're talking about? What are some tweaks that you mentioned about zoning? Nobody's been real specific. Uh, I've had some farmers talk about how. And I, you know, they didn't get detailed. They just kind of said, 
mentioned about uh, if they want to sell off pieces of their property that they've got to do it certain ways and different things like that and they think some of that may be a little harsh or may not be the right way and we didn't go into detail so I can't go into detail with you here today um, but those are some of the issues the yard sale um, I personally think if you want to have a yard sale in your yard every Saturday have a yard sale okay you know it's your property you know I can't shouldn't be able to regulate what you do within reason Mm -hmm. uh, and within the law on your property. We have a nuisance ordinance that if uh, the county has that if someone's yard is cluttered with junk or what they call their business that's their yard sale, mm -hmm. uh, we should be able to regulate things like that. It should be not be kept as an eyesore, not be seen as an eyesore by your neighbors. Well, we just got your story of a, of a uh, resident of Hilton County who just spending 30 days in jail where um, he was brought up on charges, he was fined $16,100, he didn't necessarily clean it up as much as, the, as quickly as the judge liked and the judge sent him away for 30 days. Yes. Now I think maybe the judge may have stepped back upon the length of that. Um, I heard that there was a possibility of that. Um, but that's the nuisance law that you're talking about? I believe he was charged under a nuisance ordinance, yes. Okay. Um, so we've talked about zoning, we've talked about some infrastructure um, and, and the drug issue. What, and you had mentioned the emergency, per, the emergency management service, it's a big for the, the judge exec position. Are there other areas that the judge exec and the fiscal court oversees <laughs> that um, you feel um, are vital and need to be, or that are important to this county that you just, you know, really needs to be focused upon by that position? Well, roads is always a big topic, and I know from your Facebook page, people are asking, what are you doing with the slip here, the slip there, and you're going to blacktop this road, that top, blacktop that road. And you got to remember, um, at least on my knowledge, if it's a state highway, if it has a number, mm -hmm. it's not our responsibility. It's the state highway department. Yeah. Um, now, the county roads are, of course, our responsibility. Um, I don't hear a lot of complaints about it, except you'll hear a lot this winter probably if it's a shoveler. Mm -hmm. Why don't you get to my road quick enough? Uh, why, are, why am I still buried six feet under? So, you know, there's those types of issues. Do we, can we better manage our time uh, to get into those things cleaned up and, and allocating the monies in a certain way? And it's the magistrate's responsibility to get the road funds, as I understand it, and determine what roads they want to block top in their districts and the judge agrees with that yeah know, of course so you know I have the or the judge has the uh, the tie-breaking vote in those types of situations or you know if it's a county-wide issue uh, so a lot of that depends on the magistrates gotcha um, one of the final questions that, that kind of I wanted to touch about and, and it was funny yesterday Sam Clanahan was sitting here one of our reporters and we were brainstorming questions as I finalized my list, and, and I thought he had a great um, um, potential question to ask. And as you look back, as you said, 24 years you've been involved, as you look back as, at your time there, and you're kind of evaluating your time that you served, is there something, and I, I won't necessarily want to know the specific event, but was there something that, you, that your office handled that afterwards you thought, I could have done this better, and what was it you learned that you then put into effect the next time you had to handle something like that? You know, as an office, or personally, probably more than anything, I have to go back to the flood. Okay. Uh, learned a lot during those months. Um, wish I didn't learn as much as I did in some cases. You know, it's a, it's a touchy situation. You know, I, you know, back in the day, and I probably still do today, get blamed because of something didn't go right. I can't help that. You know, it's, it's behind us now. The uh, only thing I can do is learn to work forward to make sure that we don't fall into that trap again. Example, the Emergency Operations Center or Dispatch Center, where it's located. Okay. During the flood, we moved five different times our communications. Why? Why? 
Uh, because every time we moved, the water kept getting higher. Okay. Or uh, like we were in the, in the southern the gym area there at one time. Well, they wanted school back. <laughs> so we had to get out. Yeah. Uh, so we moved to a trailer at the top of uh, the viaduct there across from Napa for a while. Uh, the police department was in there as well. So infrastructure, uh, I think, is a big thing. Uh, the, the tornado in 2012 in the and, uh, Peach Grove area. Um, I was focused on responding to a tractor trailer wreck because that was the first thing that come through as an overturned tractor trailer um, on the double A. Mm -hmm. So I was headed to that and, and couldn't get there timely. And then getting my guys out of harm's way and getting them to respond to that area. So to operating differently and better prioritizing, I think, is something that I've learned to do better. Mm -hmm. um, and I get, uh, of course we all do, we all have a tendency to micromanage sometimes. And I think learning how to back myself off from those types of things uh, and let whoever may be more knowledgeable than me at that point or is at least capable mm -hmm. of handling it. Handling. Yeah. You know, and I learned this at the end of my athletic director years, and I, and I pass this on to uh, Jordan Woodruff, is that the most important position, the most important task that position does is hire coaches. Because you hire the right coaches and your problems diminish greatly. Yes. You hire the wrong coaches then you're going to have greater problems. Yes. Just kind of like you said, you, you hire the right people to oversee and run projects and let them do the job. Give them their resources, let them do the job, and, and it'll take care of itself. And, and a, an example I've given a few people um, is, as judge executive, I don't have to know how to block cops. Mm -hmm. That's what the road supervisor and the road department's for. they got to know how to physically operate the equipment. Yeah. I've got to go get them the materials, the money, the resources they need to blacktop that road or remove the snow. So, in that respect. It's, yeah. okay. So, what's the, what, you know, kind of finishing this up, final question. What's the one thing from all your experiences that, that you're talking to people about that you think is, is the reason they should consider you? Uh, the one reason, I think, would be um, honesty, integrity, it's two. Uh, <laughs> they go together. <laughs> and um, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm willing to uh, do what I can for this county and this community to help us drive. Okay. Well, you know, I, I said the same thing as I finished up with uh, Judge Fields' interview uh, the other day, yesterday. Um, one of the things that's nice about this county race this year, we got a lot of great candidates. We've got a lot of great um, um, leaders that are running against each other. And um, you've done a wonderful job as sheriff. Um, he's done a good job over the last four years. It's a hard choice. I, I, hard choice because you both would do outstanding jobs. Right. And um, that, that's good when voters have those um, choices. So uh, we appreciate you coming in and setting some time down. Hopefully you all have gathered some information. I, I made the comment yesterday, none of these interviews are about gotcha interviews because I don't believe in that. It's about informing people. It's probably the teacher coming out in me um, that hopefully the, re the listeners and the readers have picked up some information that they didn't know that may help them make a decision, may make it a harder decision for them, which is good either way. So we appreciate you coming in, providing that thing. Um, over your last couple months as uh, sheriffs, um, if, if there's issues that come up that we need to do something like this to inform people what you're doing in your department, love to sit down and do it with you now. Kind of focus on the political season right now. We get to the end of November, December. Love to have you come back <coughs> and an interview with something going on uh, with the sheriff's department. Yeah, uh, I'm not, um, I have 13 weeks left as, as your sheriff. And 
if I win the judges, judges race, I'm not retiring. I am basically going to term limit out uh, because I'm, I won't be double dipping, so to speak, as what uh, you've been able to do in the past. Oh. Because my, if I win the election, the retirement that I've received through the judge's office will just accumulate to my current retirement. So you won't be getting a pension from your time as a sheriff while drawing a salary as judge exec. That is correct. You'd just be drawing the salary as judge exec. Correct. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's some people, you know, some things people don't, may not understand. Oh, absolutely. So I'm, I'm going to go out gracefully from the <laughs> sheriff's office and, uh, and, like I said, I've enjoyed it 24 years. Yeah. And, of course, in that position, and to every politician who would step up and, and put themselves in that, that position to lead the county, knowing that a lot of times you're going to get grief more than you're going to get praise, I think all politicians deserve a debt of gratitude for stepping in and putting themselves out there. Yes. And so thank you again for sitting down and talking to us. Um, have uh, Later this week will be our candidates for the sheriffs. Uh, one will be in here in just a little bit, and they got two scheduled tomorrow, so those will also be coming up on the website. So hopefully it will be five or six that will be posted up on Monday and Tuesday. Um, as, I, as I said at the end of uh, Judge Fields's, these people are going to get tired of seeing my ugly mug. Uh, I may have to recruit somebody else to do some of these because people are going to say, I'm sick and tired, at least the geek, and I'm sick and tired of talking sometimes. So, um, but I appreciate you stepping in, appreciate you coming by and talking, and um, we'll be talking to you soon with some other candidates.